Uh, Thomas Sowell is the closest thing this century has come to on the order of an Emancipation Proclamation. He is a scholar who has devoted his labors to looking behind the cliches of abjection, to sing out not that there is no such thing as racial discrimination on the contrary, not that there is an instantaneous route to affluence, but that the color of an American skin is not a birthmark that commits him to substandard life. What is extraordinary is that the labors of Mr. Soul, far from exciting the kind of enthusiastic reception one would expect, have met in some cases with near hysterical denunciations, even from some black leaders. It is as if the head of the Anti-Slavery League had denounced Abraham Lincoln for signing the Emancipation Proclamation. Indeed, that proclamation meant that there would no longer be slavery, but it also meant that there would no longer be an anti-slavery league. Thomas Sowell was born in the South, but came north with his family as a boy, and at Stuyvesant High, from which he graduated going on to Marines, and then matriculating in Harvard. There he received a degree in economics, going on to Columbia for his master's, and to the University of Chicago for his doctorate. He has taught at Rutgers, at Howard, at Cornell, Brandeis, Amherst, was professor of economics at UCLA. He is now a senior fellow of the Hoover Institution at Stanford. William F. Buckley, Jr., on November 12th, 1981, almost exactly 30 years ago, introducing Thomas Sowell. As best I can tell, the only thing that's changed is the kind of glasses you wear, Tom. <laughs> But as uh, Bill said, you have spent your career looking behind the cliches of abjection. There was no one like him, was there? Welcome to Uncommon Knowledge. I'm Peter Robinson. As you've heard, today's guest is Dr. Thomas Sowell, whose newest book is The Thomas Sowell Reader. And Tom, I begin by pointing out something the copy editor missed. You wrote in your introduction that you were summarizing the work of a lifetime, which of course should read summarizing the work of a lifetime so far. On the other hand, when you're 81 years old, I think that <laughs> the different distinction is not that very great. All right, segment one, equality. A quotation and another clip. The quotation from the Thomas Sowell Reader, quote, if one confused word can gum up social policies, the legal system, and innumerable institutions throughout society, that word is equality. The video clip from the presidential campaign of 2008. My attitude is that if, if the economy is good for folks from the bottom up, it's going to be good for everybody. If you've got a plumbing business, uh, you're going to be better off if you've got a whole bunch of customers who can afford to hire you. And right now, everybody's so pinched that business is bad for everybody. And, and I think when you spread the wealth around, it's good for everybody. Spread the wealth around in the name of greater equality for bus drivers and plumbers and construction workers. What's wrong with that? <laughs> What's wrong is the track record of spreading the wealth around. Uh, what has happened around the world and what is happening under the Obama administration is an attempt to attempts to spread the wealth or in fact spreading poverty. Why? Because you attack the people who are creating the most wealth not only for themselves but society. Don't forget people don't get wealth just because they're greedy. They get wealth because other people voluntarily uh, pay them their money. And they voluntarily part with their money only because they're getting something that they consider worth it. So when President Obama says he wants to spread the wealth around, what he's saying is he wants to insert the government into voluntary Transaction. transactions, which doesn't work. And it doesn't work for a very simple reason. Right. Uh, uh, the, the, people, the people at the high end of the, of the income scale don't just stand still to be sheared like sheep. They send their money overseas as they're doing now. I was reading the other day about some company, you know, that, that needs some money for uh, expansion or whatever, uh, and they have overseas branches. Now, they're making that money overseas, but they're borrowing money here instead of bringing it home. And they don't bring it home because it'll be taxed to death if they bring it home. Now, you keep raising the taxes, and they'll do more and more of their businesses overseas. Uh, and the, the jobs that are created will be created overseas. So this, this is not, wh whether they have high or low taxes on the rich is going to affect the rich a lot less that is going to affect people who are looking for jobs and, and, and people who have small businesses like hardware stores and whatnot who can't move overseas. How come you see that and Barack Obama doesn't? 
Oh my goodness! Well, he's his whole life has been spent among people who have an entirely different vision of the world, different from from ordinary Americans, different from you. Both. All right, and their vision. Uh, well, well they're, they're, for one thing, it, it tends to be a one-step vision. They, they don't they don't say what are going to be the repercussions of this if I do this, uh, and so they think that you know we, we shouldn't have tax cuts for the rich. You see, because that, that, the rich don't, don't need it, don't deserve it, and so forth. And, so and the, their analysis ends there. And it ends there. Right. Whereas if you look back through history, you find that when you had very high taxes on upper-income people, uh, you didn't collect as much revenues, in many cases, as you did with high, lower tax rates. The Thomas Sowell Reader. Although differences in choices and performances are ignored or dismissed in politically correct quarters, such differences obviously affect differences in outcomes. And you then, in the Thomas Sowell Reader, compare the different economic records. This is fascinating, but I mean, there's a lot fascinating in here, but this struck me especially. You'd compare the difference in economic performance, not between whites and blacks mm -hmm. in this country, but between whites and whites in Europe. Yes. Tell us about the difference between Danes and Greeks. Oh, well, if you, if you look at Eastern Europe and Western Europe, the economic differences between Eastern Europeans and Western Europeans is greater than that between blacks and whites in America. And people ask, how, why is there such a gap here? Why is there such a gap there? I say, well, well ever, ever since the Civil Rights Act, why hasn't that gap uh, closed completely? I say, look at Eastern and Western Europe. They've been on the same continent. Europeans, they've been on the same continent for, for centuries, and the gap hasn't closed. So, you know, gaps don't close that fast. So we need to be, the underlying message here is be realistic about what actually causes growth. Mm -hmm. Be realistic about the durability of culture, even of economic culture, yes. work habits. And, oh, yes. All right. And don't worry about income inequality. Let the rich get rich as long as the poor are getting, in other words, you don't care too much about the, the gap, do you, or do you? Uh, well, much of the gap is fictitious in the sense that uh, uh, the same person is in the bottom 20% today, and 20 years later, uh, he's not, he, very few of them will, will still be in that bottom 20%. There'll be far more of them in the top 20% who started in the bottom 20 than there are who remained in the bottom 20. So one of the problems with our statistics is that they are about abstractions. They're not about flesh and blood people. The people move through these uh, brackets uh, over a lifetime. Almost everybody started out at the bottom and got as high as, as, as they got. That doesn't mean when they get high up that they are the rich. Uh, you know, they, they, there's someone who's arrived there at the end of 20 or 30 years. One more video clip, Tom, if you don't mind. It's hard to argue against that. Warren Buffett's secretary shouldn't pay a higher tax rate than Warren Buffett. <laughs> it is wrong that in the United States of America, a teacher or a nurse or a construction worker who earns $50,000 should pay higher tax rates than somebody pulling in Fifty million dollars. Explain by somebody who's making fifty million dollars a year in the financial markets should be paying fifteen percent on their taxes. When a teacher making fifty thousand dollars a year is paying more than that, paying a higher rate, they ought to have to answer for that. And if they're pledged to keep that kind of unfairness in place. They should remember the last time I checked, the only pledge that really matters is the pledge we take to uphold the Constitution. <laughs> so, by the way, I have to make a brief factual correction. He referred to Warren Buffett's having made $50 million. Warren Buffett later announced that last year he made $62 million. Yeah, well, that's not underestimate <laughs> Warren Buffett. <laughs> All right, so, but he kept, the President of the United States kept talking about the prima facie unfairness of a secretary, what did he say, a teacher or a nurse or a construction worker paying a lower, a higher rate than a hedge fund manager or one of the richest men in the world, Warren Buffett. Now, th there's something to that, isn't there? One of, this, one, of, one of Barack Obama's great gifts is the ability to say things that are absolutely absurd <laughs> and make them sound not only plausible but inspiring. First of all, the vast majority of taxes are paid by people in the upper 10% of the income thing. So the whole picture that he's painting there has no relationship to reality. It may well be that if someone has capital gains, 
that they will pay a lower rate of taxation in a given year. Of course, capital gains are not there in a, in a given year. Uh, that you may have stock options accumulating over five or ten years, and then in one year when you uh, when you cash them in, that year you have a spike in your income. Right. Uh, and so the, the capital gains tax takes into account the fact that this wasn't all earned that particular year, even right. though you got it that year. Right. So, you know, it's, 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 it's ludicrous. But, it, but it, it's, it's, it's very clever ludicrousness. Mm. Segment two, Karl Marx and Ronald Reagan. Um, <clears throat> the Thomas Sowell Reader is, of course, a book of analysis and opinion. Not long ago, I asked you, Tom, what opinion, what view do you regret having held? And you replied that for more than a decade, more than a decade, you had been a serious Marxist. Yes. Explain that. Well, as that decade began, I was in, uh, living in, in poverty. How old? 19 years old. 19. So you're in high, uh, you're starting college at that stage? Oh, or? good heavens, no. No, all right. I mean, I, I was out there working in unskilled jobs and trying to make ends meet, living in a rooming house. Up in Harlem? You're living in, in Harlem? Ha on Harlem. Right. Uh, and uh, I, I, I'd heard about Marx, but I finally someplace found an old uh, secondhand set of encyclopedias for $1.19, which I bought. And there was, was a, an article on Karl Marx, and it seemed to me that he explained these situations so well that... Uh, and the situation was what? That you the, the, took the train from Harlem down to the lower well, end of Manhattan? No, I, no, the other way around, coming home from work, I would sometimes take the bus, and it would go right up Fifth Avenue past all these glitzy places, and like cross 57th Street where all the fancy uh, stores were, and Carnegie Hall and the rest of it. And then finally, uh, it was, I got near home, it would kind of turn off this uh, viaduct uh, into 135th Street, and there was that sudden change uh, in the whole scene at that point. And the question was, why was that? And the problem was uh, two, two problems. One was that no one else had, had given any explanation. There was no competing explanation that sounded plausible. In your life so far? Yes, right. yes. Uh, and the other was that uh, no one had cautioned me that it takes an awful lot more knowledge before you can make these kinds of sweeping judgments in any case. Uh, but fortunately, I'd been uh, taught earlier to, to respect facts and so on. And so even during my years as a Marxist, I would read things by people who weren't Marxist. I would read facts and so forth. But you, you, I have heard you say many times that you got a good education in the New York City public schools yes. in Harlem. Yes. So they did, they taught you to think. They yes. may not have taught you Adam Smith and yes. the defense of free markets, but they taught you to think. Yes. All right, now, but keep, continue the story if you would. You're a Marxist at the age of 19 taking the bus home Right. From the southern third of Manhattan Island right. all the way up to Harlem. You remain a Marxist at the University of Chicago under the instruction of... Milton Friedman. Milton Friedman. Yes. How did that... If, if Milton couldn't crack you, you were a tough nut. <laughs> well, uh, uh, but, but, but one summer working for the government as an economist was enough to uh, uh, show me that the government was really not the answer. That the government, that the level of understanding uh, uh, among the people, and, and, I, and I was in a, in a program for interns where we saw the top officials of the Labor Department and so forth, and, and I you, realized these guys are not going to save us. They, <laughs> in other words, they had no, they were not the priestly caste no. that you might have been led to expect. They were ordinary chumps bashing their way through life as best they could like anybody else. Yes. I see. All right. And so, but intellectually, all right, you spend a summer working for the federal government, and that cures you of Marxism. Yes. But intellectually, when do you pick up the thread of free markets? Oh, I guess, well, well, well I, I had always... You, then I, you thought back to what Milton had said. That's right. It's, it's I not, see. It's not, not, not just Milton, but, but Hayek and the rest of them. Okay. Because I had read all those people while I was still a Marxist. A couple of... Uh, you have a, uh, an essay in here entitled Marx the Man. Oh, yes. Quote, Marx's angry apocalyptic visions existed before he discovered capitalism as the focus of such visions. Yes. Explain that. Well, if you, you can, the, the poems he wrote in his uh, teen years, uh, one of them in particular I remember went to, to this effect that, uh, then will I wa walk godlike and triumphant through the ruins of the world. So he has these... Uh, apocalyptic visions early on before he's ever even thought about capitalism. And what the subtext, as I take it, of your 
It's entitled Marx, not the Marx, the political philosopher, not Marx, the economist, but Marx, the man. Yes. And what you're, the, what I felt reading that essay is, you're in effect, it's like the scene in The Wizard of Oz where they pull back the curtain. Yes, that's the right. The great and powerful Oz turns out to be an ordinary, cranky human being. Yes. And what you're saying is Marx is in, he's fascinating and some highly intelligent, but in some cases, in some ways, kind of a nut. Yes. Just a man. Yes. All right. Another quotation from that essay. The members of the Communist League, we're talking now about the mid-19th century, Marx and Engels form or they participate in the Communist League. The members of the Communist League were overwhelmingly intellectuals and professionals. It had the same kind of social composition that would in later years characterize many radical groups in which the youthful offspring of privilege called themselves the proletariat. Marxism is the conceit of rich kids with fancy educations. Yes, you, you see that uh, in the, what is this thing called, uh, the Occupy Wall Street group. Uh, all these middle class uh, uh, accents and so on. I mean, how many working class people can afford to take a month off to sit around in parks uh, and carry on and, and have all their uh, electronic equipment with them and all the rest of it? I mean, come Sleeping on. Sleeping in sleeping bags with the first rate down feathers. Oh, right, yes. Right. So, but at what stage was there a moment when you said, wait a moment, these putative Marxists and leftists and uh, liberals, to use the term the way it's used in this country, is a leftist, they have, no cons they have no knowledge of nor concern for what life is like up on 130th Street. That's right. There was That's a moment, right. was there a moment or an incident when that just struck you? Or that was kind of a progressive realization? It was, it was a sort of progressive re re realization. All right. Ronald Reagan, the Thomas Sowell, I like ju juxtapositions here from Karl Marx to Ronald Reagan, but you do it yourself. One old fashioned way to judge a president is by results. A more popular way is by how well he fits the preconception of the intelligentsia or the media. By the first test, Ronald Reagan was the most successful president of the United States in the 20th century. By the second test, he was a complete failure. Yes. The Marxists are rich kids with fancy educations. You've got the intelligentsia misreading Ronald Reagan. And you've got Tom Sowell from a very early age to the present, when he remains a fellow at Stanford, at the Hoover Institution at Stanford, making his career in academia all the same. How is it that you're able to swim against the current? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Please don't be quite so truthful. This is television. We need <laughs> oh, I, 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 I guess uh, partly luck, uh, but but uh, but uh, uh, I know I don't know. It's um, there are there are places. I mean, there are pl well, like the Hoover Institution. No, it's no great uh, handicap to have the views that I have here, uh, and there are a few other places here and there. Do you feel? Uh, as I mentioned to you before we started shooting, we put up a notice on our Facebook page, Uncommon Knowledge's Facebook page, saying that you'd be a guest inviting people to submit questions. Hundreds of questions. Mm -hmm. You are unambiguously the most requested guest on our little program. And if you read some of these comments, it's clear they come overwhelmingly from young people. Many, many wow. from college students. Do you feel a sea change? Well, I, I think there have always been people who have been uh, sort of the outposts, you know, sort of, I, 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 I think of Beau Geste, but, but, <laughs> but no, there have always, always been some people like that, and uh, I'm glad they watch, watch your program. All right. Uh, segment three, Love and Marriage, mm -hmm. the Thomas Sowell reader, quote, it may be a sign of our times that everyone seems to be talking openly about sex but we seem to be embarrassed to talk about love. Yes. Explain that one for me. Well, I can't quite explain why that situation exists, but I, I do I have some ideas about the consequences of that, that people greatly underestimate the importance of uh, love. The human race could not survive without love, uh, not even physically, because uh, when a newborn baby enters the world, uh, there's an awful a lot of things demanded uh, and uh, w the baby is in no position to compensate anybody. Uh, and so the only thing is that the love of babies is what keeps them alive. And if the parents are so, uh, are so, so bad 
that uh, they don't have that, then the society has backup systems whereby the baby will still be kept alive. Mm. Again, the Thomas Sowell reader, love is one of those bonds which enable people to function and mm. societies to flourish without being directed from above. Yes. Love is one of the many ways we influence each other and work out our interrated, interrelated lives without the help of the anointed. Yes. Now, the, of course, the theme that runs all the way through this book, as we've already established, is the anointed, the intelligentsia. And what you're saying here is, in fact, a kind of brutal analysis. You are saying that their drive to power yes. is so extreme that in some way it leads them to smother their own natural instinct toward love and to disregard it in other people. Well, the, the, is that the, the, fair? Well, or an lo, well lo, lo, love is one of the things that makes it possible for us to live without the anointed telling us what to do. But there are other things too that uh, create independence that the anointed are very much annoyed by, ranging from guns to automobiles. That uh, the, the whole thing, you know, the very. You know, I think I see an answer to Occupy Wall Street. It's Tom Sowell, and we're going to call it Love, Guns, and Automobiles. <laughs> But, but go ahead, explain that, that ordinary people leading their own lives. Without any uh, need to uh, seek, seek direction from, from above, from the anointed, uh, that annoys them. Otherwise, they, they would be cut out of this loop entirely. All right. Marriage. Again, the Thomas Sowell reader, despite attempts to equate married couples with people who are living together as domestic partners, married couples, genuinely married couples, not domestic partners, are in fact better off by almost any standard you can think of." Close quote. Income. People who are married have higher incomes. Uh, domestic violence. The rate of domestic violence in marriage is a fraction of what it is among people who are simply living together. The abuse of children uh, in married couples, uh, families, is a fraction of what the, what the abuse of children is um, among people who are simply living together. So if you put it to an empirical test, it's just very clear that marriage makes a difference. Among blacks, black married couples have had a poverty rate in single digits every year since 1994. So there is a difference. Now, no-fault divorce, making divorce easier. This begins in, what, the 60s, I guess, is when it really picks up steam. There are a few states earlier than that. No-fault divorce is now uh, commonplace throughout, across the country. Most recently, we have gay marriage. Mm. Uh, New York, what New York is, I guess, the third largest state by population these days. New York enacted gay marriage. Is there a, uh, am I reading too much? Would you see a continuum of a kind of animus against this fundamental institution of oh, marriage? Oh, yes. You would. Y yes. Uh, the first draft of the Communist Manifesto, which Engels wrote, uh, sp specifically wanted to uh, 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 dismember the family. And Marx uh, decided that that, 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 wa that wasn't going to fly. Uh, and so when he rewrote it, he left that out. But, that, but that's been there if you follow the left back over the past two centuries. You see in there one way or another where they try to undermine the decision-making autonomy of the family. Uh, Hillary they Clinton, sense it as an enemy from the very beginning. Oh, absolutely. The Hill when Hillary Clinton said, you know, it takes a village to raise a child. Uh, and someone said it takes a village idiot to believe that. <laughs> uh, <you> know, <laughs> what they're saying is they want to come in there and tell them. You see, it's, it's part of the whole thing of third parties wanting to make decisions for which they pay no price when, they, when, when they're wrong. You see, when, 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 the, when the parent raises the child the wrong way, the parent pays the price when the child goes down the tubes. But these third parties can sit back in their air, wherever, they're, wherever they are, Washington or whatever, and if the things they tell us turn out to be wrong, it doesn't hurt them. For example, uh, f before we introduced sex education into the schools in the 60s, the rate of venereal disease had been going down every single year. Teenage pregnancy had been going down every single year. I think it was the uh, rate of uh, uh, infection for uh, gonorrhea in 1960 was half of what it was in 1950. So all these things were going down before the, 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 the left came into the schools with their sex education. And all these things reversed and shot up immediately afterwards. But nobody, paid any price. nobody who pushed that paid any price for it. Mm. The Thomas Sowell Reader. I'm going to quote you, and then I'm going to quote John Kennedy. Okay. All right? 
the Thomas Sowell reader, four-letter words like love, duty, work, and save are hallmarks of people who make their own way through life without being part of some grandiose scheme of the anointed or of government bureaucracies that administer such schemes. Close quote. Ask not, John Kennedy said, what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. And I thought to myself, I believe Tom Sowell would answer John Kennedy and say, no, don't ask what you can do for your country. That's already presumption and arrogance. Mm. Ask what you can do for your family. Yes. Ask what you can do to take care of yourself. Ask what you can do for your neighbors. Is that true? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Now, you mentioned one of the four-letter words, work. Mm. You also mentioned that you're now 81 years old. Mm. As I understand it from talking to your assistant, this is one of two books that you intend to bring out this academic year. Tom, you haven't had anything to prove to anybody for, well, you heard the way Bill Buckley introduced you 30 years ago. You were already an esteemed, why do you work so hard? What, 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 Why what, do you what, keep at it? Take up golf, <laughs> gardening. Well, you, you, you missed the most important thing. Uh, I checked my uh, pension with TIAA. It's virtually identical with my salary, so I'm essentially working for nothing. <laughs> <laughs> but why? Why? There are things I, wa I, I, I want to do and things I want to say, and uh, I haven't finished saying them yet. The work has value in itself. Yes. All right. Segment four, national pastimes. I checked the index in the Thomas Sowell Reader. Ronald Reagan, whom you called the most successful president of the 20th century, appears on five pages. Babe Ruth appears on seven. <laughs> Tell me about the dead ball controversy. Oh, my goodness. This, this is the argument that the... That the uh, you, see, you see, for the first two decades of the 20th century, uh, nobody hit as many as 30 home runs in a season. Uh, those who hit Not Ty Cobb, none of the, none of the people we, we revere as the great sluggers of that era. None. Nobody came to 20. Right. Okay. And they came to, came to 30. 30, sorry. All right. Uh, of those who got as far as 20 home runs, nobody did it twice. In the entire decade. In the, the, quite, in the entire two, two, first two decades, de sorry, two decades right. of the 20th century. Now the 1920s come along, and there are all sorts of people hitting 40 or more home runs and doing it more than one time. And so the argument has been made, they changed the ball. The problem is that if you, if you look at the people who were the big sluggers prior to the 1920s, many of whom played, the, uh, played during the 1920s, had big seasons during the 1920s, and none of them hit 20 home runs during the 1920s. The people who hit the 40 home runs and more were new people. They were people who either came into the league that year, like Lou Gehrig, Mel Ott, uh, and, and, and Chuck Klein, or, or else they were people whose career had begun just before the 20s and reached their peak in the 20s. And what, was, what had happened was that they, they started using the batting style that Babe Ruth used. We have two video clips for you to comment on. Ah. Uh, Ty Cobb. Ah. Uh, Tell me about that swing. Oh, it's a very level swing. He's, he's hitting line drives. You, you were taught not to uppercut the ball because you fly out a lot. Okay, which brings us to tape number, uh, clip number yes, two. Babe Here Ruth. we go, the Bambino. Yes. All right, tell me about that swing. He's, he's, he's hitting up. He's, he grasps the bat down at the, at the end of the bat, which gives him more leverage and less control. And some people have theorized that Babe Ruth got away with that because he started his career as a pitcher, and no one cared how pitchers batted. So, so they didn't correct him. It's a kind of risk return, uh, meaning it's a riskier way to swing, yes. a little less control. Yes. But if you connect, if you have Babe Ruth's shoulders, yeah. and you connect. So he invented, it's true, isn't it? Yes. It started with Babe Ruth. Oh, absolutely. He invented the, uh, uh, the an home entirely run. new technique. Yes. Were you a baseball fanatic before you were a Marxist? Do you have one? Yes. So we have one fanaticism that remains throughout your life. Oh, absolutely. All right. The Thomas Sowell Reader, as so often happens, you're writing now the dead ball controversy, where there is a strong preconception shared by many people. No alternative explanation was considered, much less tested empirically. Yes. Why are human beings, even baseball fans, such boneheads? Well, well listen, listen, compared to people in politics, the baseball fans are geniuses. <laughs> Uh, uh, when, when you look at income data and compare it with baseball data, baseball data uh, follows a given person throughout a career. 
income data follows blocks of people, and they're not the same people in these income brackets. You know, so it's 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 a it's a much more is much more realistic. All right. So all those millions of Americans who sense somehow that when they're watching a sporting event, they're watching some authentic slice of reality. Yes. They're right. Yes. All right. From the national pastime of baseball to the national pastime of politics uh -huh. and Republican presidential candidate Herman Cain. A few days ago, you and I happened to have a brief conversation about Mr. Cain, and I suggested that part of his appeal may well be that he has an authenticity as an African-American. Mm -hmm. He was uh, raised in Georgia. His dad was a janitor and a chauffeur. His mother was a cleaning lady. He goes to Moorhouse, which is a yes. historically black institution. He really partakes of the black experience in this country in a way that Barack Obama, who's raised substantially by his white mother and his quite well-to-do, oh, I don't know, they're not rich people, but yeah. he's raised in uh, well-to-do suburbs and gets a fancy education at Columbia and Harvard. Mm. And you said, don't count on it. Don't count on Herman Cain's authenticity cutting much ice. Because you were raised in a ghetto, you said, mm. and nobody cut you too much slack over that. No, no. Uh, pe people believe what they want to believe, and they wanted to believe that uh, that Barack Obama represented uh, the Black American experience, which he, which he which he did not. I mean, how many Black Americans go to expensive private schools prior to going to Columbia? Never mind Columbia and the rest of it. Uh, but people believe what they want to believe, and they projected their own feelings onto Obama, who had such little track record in politics that they could do that and believe all kinds of things that were wholly uh, unlikely. But the Tea Party is racist. We know that, don't we? <laughs> it's like so many things that have been repeated so often that they're regarded as well-known facts. And in this case, I'm afraid it was very cynically done. Uh, you may remember the story. You mean the, d denigrating the Tea Party is racist. Oh, absolutely. These people For, who are no, now no. rallying behind Herman Cain. Well, but 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 you see, the the re the, the, the key thing was when uh, there was these Congress people walking up Capitol Hill, right. and it was said that there, all kinds of racist things were said. Now the media were on the scene with all their rec recording equipment. Nowadays, everybody and his brother has some kind of recording equipment, iPhone or whatever. Uh, right. That's right. Someone offered a hundred thousand dollars to anybody who could bring forth one example from that episode where anything racist was said. No, nobody has claimed a hundred grand yet. Zero. Yes. All right. Segment five, the present predicament. Thomas Sowell on this program shortly before the election of 2008. This man, Barack Obama, really does believe that he can change the world and people like that are infinitely more dangerous than mere crooked politicians. Yes. You were talking about candidate Obama. In what ways has President Obama surprised you? None. Uh, he has uh, followed policies which have ruined the economy. He has followed uh, foreign policies that have emboldened our enemies. Uh, I, don't, I, don't, I can't imagine Iran trying to set off a bomb in the United States to kill a Saudi ambassador during the Reagan administration. Mm. Mm. Uh, you may recall that Iran had all those hostages under Jimmy Carter. They were released hours before Ronald Reagan took office. So it, it matters who the president is, and it matters how he comes across. Despite President Obama's original plan, we still have troops in Iran. Iraq. Excuse me, Iraq. Thank you, Iraq. He actually increased the number of troops we placed in Afghanistan. Mm. We still are using Guantanamo. Now, I don't... Uh, deny for a moment that all of these are reversals for him, but he did reverse himself in these policies. And of course, we got Osama bin Laden under his on his watch. Don't you give him some credit for? Well, there's no need to. He takes the credit. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, the, the the special ops who went in there, uh, they did the job. They learned where uh, they had the, the information that led up to this over the years from having uh, done these uh, in enhanced interrogations of people at, at Guantanamo that, uh, that led to all this. And the fact that he happened to be there in the White House while they were ma making this uh, raid uh, uh, in Pakistan really uh, doesn't tell you an awful lot. All right. 
then if President Obama has not surprised you, has the rise, excuse me, I back up, when you, when we talked just before the election of 2008, I believe it was October, so it was an even three years ago, you used the phrase, the turning point, that we may be approaching a point, excuse me, a point of no return yes. with Barack Obama. And since then, we have the rise of the Tea Party. Did that surprise you? Does that hurt you? Oh, that did, that did surprise, surprise me. And how do you understand that? Oh, I, I, I think that there, are, there have always been people out there who uh, had, had those kinds of views, and they just didn't coalesce. And so that does mean that we have a chance next year uh, of, of changing the direction of the country, uh, restoring us uh, some sanity in Washington. So what Richard Nixon called the silent majority has found its voice? Apparently. Is that a fair? Uh, yes. All yes. right. Let me name a few names. People want to know what you think of certain people. I'll name a name. You tell me in a sentence or two. Well, far be it from me to delimit your answers. You tell me at any length you wish what you make of him. Rick Perry. The, what I most liked about him was his saying the Republican Party cannot be, be all things to all people. Too many Republicans don't understand that. They think that you have to go out and cater to this group and that group. They ignore the fact that Ronald Reagan did not do that. He was the same person to everybody. And I doubt if uh, even half the people who voted for him agreed with him on every single thing. But they saw, they saw him as being for real, and they knew what he stood for, and he thought that was, they thought that was going to be better for the country and for them. So you have not written off Rick Perry. You fundamentally like that guy. Yeah. All right. Mitt Romney. Mitt Romney is one of those people who is, uh, I, I, he reminds me of a character in a movie called The Best Man, where there were two uh, contestants for the party nomination, and they killed each other off. And in the final scene, not killed, literally, uh, in, the final, in the final scene, there is this man, this bland-looking man, who gets on this escalator heading up, because he's heading up there to be nominated for the presidency. And, you know, and I, and I, every time I see uh, uh, Mitt Romney, I think of that man, that he's, he's this wonderful, bland fellow uh, who hasn't uh, offended anybody. And uh, when the people who have principles knock each other off, he's the one who rises. I'm hoping that doesn't happen. Let me push a little bit on that, that you have profound respect for the markets. Mitt Romney, he came from a wealthy family, but not a not an enormously rich family, and through his own work in the markets, Bain Capital, starting a number of enterprises, including nationwide operations now, such as Staples, he has amassed a fortune of more than $600 million, as I recall, is the last report. Mm -hmm. Isn't that an index of a certain level of skill and enterprise? Absolutely, and I wish he would go back to doing that. <laughs> All right. And Herman Cain. What do you make of Herman Cain as a candidate? Oh, I, 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 th I think he's a very good candidate. Uh, he may be the best candidate. Uh, the question is whether he, how would he be as president? And someone who is, has no political experience, uh, the White House is not the place for on-the-job training, as, as our current president has illustrated. All right. Um, you know, it's a little hard from those answers to deduce your favorite candidate. Rick Perry is your man at the moment, at least. Is that fair? No, or, or, I, I or think... Are you just open-minded at this point? Yeah, I, I think that it, it, uh, since, since we do have elections, and we, uh, s someone who can't win the election, regardless of what his potential as a president, uh, the, the question is about his candidacy. All right. When he was seated where you're seated just about three weeks ago, I asked Congressman Paul Ryan if he believed the country was doomed to a long period of decline contention, bitter politics, or if instead of reaching a point of no return, we had the opportunity in the election of 2012 to reach a turning point. Uh -huh. And here is Congressman Paul Ryan's reply. So the way I see it is it's all about confidence and trajectory, which is, are we getting get the trajectory of our debt and our deficits under control so our economy can be free and so it can grow and prosper? You know, are we going to go back and implement those ideas that make us that opportunity society, that upward mobility society? And do we have, are we putting that plan in place? And are we confident that we're going to reach this trajectory? We will be confident if we change the structure of government, the structure of these programs that are the drivers of these debts. And that means we have to win an affirming election where the country gives us the authority and the obligation to do this. If we don't, if we go into this election with just a personality contest, muddling the differences, just speeding each other up, then it's going to be ugly afterwards, no matter who wins. And if we fail, then at least we tried. And so that's the way I see it. 
That's actually hopeful. Mm. If we do put forward we, I say we, if, if conservatives, if the Paul Ryans of the world put forward a forthright, clear, distinct plan and win the election, the country can turn itself around. Are you more or less optimistic than Paul Ryan? Oh, that's an if, if then kind of statement. Yes, if that happens, then, 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 then we can pull out of the nosedive. Uh, and, and go on. If we pull out of the nosedive, we can pull out of the nosedive. All right, so I've, I put it to you in a tautological way. What do you think the chances are? I don't know. All right. You know, I was kind of hoping for a little more optimism here, Tom. But no? <laughs> All right. Listen, you conclude the Thomas Sowell Reader with some very sweet, moving, personal reflections. Quote, My life has been a radical contrast with the lives of other black intellectuals Perhaps most important, this was very striking to me, perhaps most important, I grew up with no fear of whites. Why did you grow up without a fear of whites, and why has that proven so important to your intellectual life? I think fear may, may, makes you uh, have all sorts of uh, sometimes irrational reactions to people. And uh, I, I grew up, for example, obviously as a, as a boy growing up in school, you get into fights and so forth. I grew up in the, in the, in the era of Joe Lewis. Whenever I saw a white fighter fighting Joe Lewis, he ended up on the, on the, on the floor. You know, so it, it, that was one thing. And uh, when, when I uh, mo moved out of my school in Harlem uh, to, a, to a school in a predominantly white school, uh, obviously from having been in Harlem and having had to fight and so forth, I was a better fighter than most of the guys around. So I had no physical fear. And then when it came to uh, intellectually, I still remember an episode that... Uh, that didn't seem that big at the time, but I think it, it was. The first time we had a math test, uh, and I was in this class for kids with, with IQs of 120 and over, it. And, the, and, the, and the math professor said, uh, a teacher said, uh, I didn't think this was that tough a, 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 a test for a class like this, and yet there was only one uh, paper that had 100, so, and, and his, his name was, and he starts going through this thing, and he says, and his name was, and so I'm standing there, I says, uh, Thomas Sowell, and, and he said, yes, that's the name. <laughs> I, was just, I was just being a wise guy. You know? <laughs> but I, I never had the condescension from my classmates after that. You were a smart kid and you were a tough kid. Yeah. Okay. Again, I'm quoting from the Thomas Sowell Reader. With all the vicissitudes of my life and the long years of living close to despair, nevertheless, in retrospect, I can see that I was lucky in many ways. Close quote. The long years of close to despair, near despair. I left home when I was uh, 17 years old. And uh, uh, I, I learned out there in the marketplace that there was no great demand for uh, high school dropouts with uh, no skills and no experience. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, uh, and there were times when, uh, when I had trouble f finding the money for food and for the rent money and so on. And I remember the, the, the lowest point, I remember walking from my, uh, where I lived in a rooming house on 142nd Street in Harlem to where I worked just below the Brooklyn Bridge. Oh my goodness. Because I did not have enough money. That's seven both, miles or so. Yeah, right. yeah, to both ride the subway and buy food. And I preferred the food. Lucky. In what ways have you been lucky? Because I, I learned things that I couldn't have learned other ways. Uh, for example, uh, there was no way I was going to live spending every dime I had thereafter. You know, uh, I, I learned that people who are ordinary people knew far more than I did, even though they were not intellectuals. And even though I, I had read more books than they had and so forth and so on. And I spent several years like that. And so I never had this uh, condescending attitude toward ordinary people that so many intellectuals have. You know, it's, I, I realized those people know a hell of a lot. And they knew a hell of a lot more than I did about things that mattered. Mm. And, I, and, and, and I remember uh, from that era, I, I, I finally reached the point where I had to ask the uh, foreman, uh, to borrow some money from him because because I, I Foreman, I, what were you working at at this? A, a machine shop down on the on the Lower East Side, and uh, to borrow more, some money from me because I, from him so I could walk, so I could ride to work on the subway and eat at the same time, and he lent me five dollars. And one of the most uh, wonderful th experiences I remember since then, decades later, when I'm in New York on a book tour, I phone him 
and invite him to dinner with his family. And we had dinner up at the top of the World Trade Center. Oh, how wonderful. And we spent the time, and uh, when we parted, uh, he and I were both on the verge of tears. Mm. You know, and that was the last time I saw him. Mm. Tom, final quotation from the Thomas Sowell Reader. The whole point of looking back on my life is to hope that others will find something useful for their own lives. Young American watching this program, 18, 19, 20, what advice do you have for a young, for someone who's just the age now that you were as a Marxist living, in, living on 130-something street? Young American in 2011. It depends on what his circumstances are, but I would say learn all you can before you reach conclusions. There are plenty of people out there who have prepackaged conclusions for you to reach. You need to have a, build up a level of knowledge and experience so that you are no longer um, putty in the hands of somebody else who has his own agenda. And let me alter the question just slightly. This really is the last question. If that young American is an African American, mm -hmm. do you alter your advice? No. Tom Sowell? author of The Thomas Sowell Reader. Thanks so much. Thank you. I'm Peter Robinson at Uncommon Knowledge. Be sure to join us, by the way, on our Facebook page at facebook.com forward slash unc knowledge, facebook.com forward slash unc knowledge, and at our brand new web address, hoover.org slash uk. Hoover with two O's dot O-R-G slash uk. Again, Peter Robinson, for Uncommon Knowledge, thanks for joining us.